everybody. My name is uh, Vladik Kananov, and the organizers asked me to do a small announcement. After this talk, we are going to have a dinner. So if I bore you to death, use food and alcohol as motivation to stay and suffer and, <laughs> and hang on. <laughs> I live in Israel. Currently, I'm chief architect at a company called Naxex. And I can really relate to this quote by Glenford Myers. He says, 95% of the words are spent extolling the benefits of modularity, and very little, if anything, is said about how to achieve it. And about four years ago, at our company, we've decided to jump on the microservices bandwagon. Of course, we read Sam Newman's book, got inspired by success stories of Netflix, Amazon, and decided to give this new modern architectural style a try. About three months later, we found ourselves in such a huge mess. What happened was we concentrated our efforts on the cool technological things, but we didn't pay due attention to much more fundamental and important stuff, modularity and how to achieve it. We invested in serverless frameworks and platforms, cool messaging mechanisms, but we didn't think over how to properly decompose a system into services or microservices. Like where to draw boundaries between them and how to decide whether some functionality belongs to one service or another one. Instead, we naively approached microservices thinking that the smaller the service, the better. And this way of thinking led us straight into the chains of the distributed monolith. Over the next few years, we tried to right our wrongs. Instead of tiny services, we evaluated different decomposition strategies. And in this presentation, I'd like to share what we've learned along the way. This is the agenda. I will describe those domain-driven design-related decomposition strategies that we've tried. Next, we'll see how they apply in the microservices world. And we'll go over some design heuristics for optimizing microservices-based architectures that we ended up using in our company. Now, since I will talk about our company quite often, I'd like to take a minute and briefly introduce you to our business domain and what we're doing. Say you're producing a product or a service. Our company allows you to outsource all your marketing-related chores. We'll come up with the best marketing strategy for your product. Our copywriters and graphic designers will produce tons of creative materials, such as banners and landing pages, that will be used to run campaigns to promote your product. All the leads generated by these campaigns are going to be handled by our sales agents who will make the calls and sell your products. And most importantly, this whole process provides many opportunities for optimization. And that's exactly what our analysis department is going to do. They're going to analyze all this data to optimize the process and make sure that our clients are getting the biggest bang for their buck. That's the business domain of our company. That wasn't a sales pitch. The company is no longer offering these services. I just wanted to introduce you to the myriad of business domains that, that we are dealing with and why it was so important for us to decompose a system into manageable components. Let's see the different ways we tried to cut it into pieces. The first one is bounded contexts. We all know that ubiquitous language is the cornerstone practice of domain-driven design. To build worthy models, we have to understand the domain experts' way of thinking. And the most effective way to do it is to speak with them and to do it in their own language. However, domain experts are humans, and humans' behavior can be complex and unpredictable. Some of them may have different mental models for the same business concepts, and others might use the same terms to describe completely different concepts. For example, in our company, we have campaign managers and sales agents. And for them, the term lead means very different things. For a campaign manager, a lead is a mere event that somebody has shown interest in one of the products and submitted his contact details. For sales agents, a lead is a much more complex entity. It has a lot of data associated with it, and it has a very rich and complex behavior. 
In such cases of conflicting models, DDD calls for splitting the ubiquitous language and explicitly, explicitly defining the context in which each smaller language applies, its bounded context. <coughs> Again, in case of our company, we have leads in two bounded contexts, marketing and sales. Each bounded context defines one and only one model of the lead that is correct in its boundaries. And when we just started, we used these boundaries to decompose our initial monolith into two separate services. Each bounded context became a separate service, marketing service and sales service. And that was our first strategy, aligning service boundaries with bounded contexts. However, these services represent pretty wide business areas. As long as there are no inconsistencies in the models, bounded context can span multiple business domains. For example, in marketing, we have creative catalog for organizing creatives, contracts for managing relations with publishers, campaign management for running the actual advertising campaigns. And in sales context, we have CRM, desks, commissions, and others. We later use these business domains to serve as the physical boundaries of the services. We divided those wide bounded contexts into smaller ones, each representing one business subdomain. We ended up with services for managing campaigns, creatives, desks, etc. And this approach is actually quite common, and in our DD community, many actually call for having a one to one relation between business domains and bounded contexts. But when we embarked on the microservices adventure, we've strived for even smaller services. We dug deeper into those business domains and extracted their entities and processes into their own microservices. For example, in our campaign management subdomain, we had business entities such as campaign, funnel, target market, and others. And we used those entities as boundaries. That was our third decomposition strategy, having each service represent one business entity process. As I told you in the introduction, initially this approach failed more than miserably for us. However, it did work later in other projects. And to quickly sum it up, those are the three decomposition strategies that we used. We started with an enormous monolithic bounded context, we split it into real bounded contexts to protect the consistency of the models. And then we tried decomposing them into smaller services, having a service per subdomain, and later on dedicating a service for a business entity. The question is, which of these three strategies is the best option for achieving those treasured microservices? Now, let's see whether bounded contexts make good microservices. I've shown you an example of conflicting models from our company, LEAD. Same term that means totally different things to different people in marketing and sales departments. To tackle this ambiguity in the model, we split the system into two distinct models, each relevant only in its own bounded context, which, me which means if you cross this boundary, will end up with inconsistent models and unexpected behaviors. But are bounded contexts actually the smallest boundaries possible? Thing is, naturally bounded contexts contain multiple related business domains. You can move those domains around, you can decompose them further into smaller bounded contexts, and as long as you don't cross the boundary of inconsistent models, According to domain-driven design, all these designs are equally valid bounded contexts. There are no conflicts in them, each term has only one meaning, and all the models in them are consistent. Therefore, bounded contexts rather really help us to identify boundaries of the biggest valid monolith. And the word valid is the key here, it's not a bad thing. Such monolith won't necessarily lead you astray to a big mall of mud, no. It's a viable model that you can work with. But that idea doesn't quite fit the notion of microservices. So for microservices, we have to look elsewhere. And we are left with two options, domains and business entities. 
To see which one is the better candidate to play this role, let's take a step back and define what are those services and microservices really are. First of all, a service is a unit of functionality exposed to the world. Or a bit more elaborately, according to the guys behind the SOA, a service is a mechanism to enable access to one or more capabilities where the access is provided using a prescribed interface. This prescribed interface part is very important. Randy Schaub, one of the pioneers of the microservices hype, sorry, of the microservices movement, <laughs> defines these prescribed interfaces as any mechanism for getting data in or out of a service. It can be synchronous, such as plain request response model or a bulk ETL operation. <coughs> it can also be asynchronous operation by producing or consuming events. But overall, synchronous or asynchronous, those are just mechanisms for getting data in or out of a service, its interface. Randy Schaub also calls the interface as the service's front door, and I really like this analogy. And that takes us to the definition of a microservice. A microservice is a service with a micro front door, a micro interface, as simple as that. The reasoning behind this is pretty straightforward. Having less connection points between services reduces coupling between them, limits their reasons for change, makes it easier to understand each service in particular and to understand the whole system in general, and it also provides better fault isolation and makes services more autonomous for development, management, and scale. Also, we all know that microservices should own their database. No other service should be able to access a microservices data directly through its database, but only through its public interface. Now, why is that? Well, because if a database is exposed outside, it becomes an enormous public interface. It's like, how many different SQL queries can you write? I guess infinity is a pretty safe estimate here. But there's a caveat here. Having a micro-public interface might sound pretty simple, right? Let's limit public interface to one method only. You, you cannot go any farther than that. And those will be perfect microservices. Well, not really. Let's see what will happen if you do just that. Say we have this backlog service with eight public methods. And we want to apply this naive decomposition here. Each service will expose only one public method. But since those are well-behaved microservices, each of them will have its own database. And no other service will be allowed to touch it. But they do have to work together somehow. They have to synchronize the changes that each service is applying. And for that, they'll expose additional public interfaces for integration purposes. And when, when visualized, those integrations and data flows look like this mess right here. <laughs> so paraphrasing Randy Schaub's metaphor, we definitely minimized the service's front door. But due to the system requirements, in addition to the front door, we created a huge staff-only entrance, the one which is used for integration with other services. Therefore, the threshold upon, upon which a system can be decomposed into microservices is defined by the use cases of the whole system, by its behavior, not by its data. In other words, if we decompose a monolith into modular microservices, the cost of introducing a change goes down. But if we continue decomposing past this threshold, the services interfaces will grow for the integration needs and the cost of changes will go back up and you will end up with a dreaded distributed monolith. <clears throat> Another way to represent this notion visually is if you have everything in one monolithic service, we get a big ball of mud. If we decompose it into proper bounded context, then the average size of the server of the service goes down, it gets even smaller for microservices, 
But if, if you keep decomposing further, the size goes down, but you find yourself in a distributed monolith, in a distributed ball of mud. So neither subdomains nor business entities can be treated as microservices in all cases. It all depends on the system that you are building and especially on its behavior, its use cases. And if you look at the bigger picture, we can see that microservices are not really about what happens inside of a service. Microservices are about the interactions and couplings between the system's components, its services. To put it another way, what happens inside of a service is local complexity and what happens outside, what we are dealing with here, is global complexity. And here I want to quote Glenford Myers again. He says, global complexity is the complexity of the overall structure of a program or a system. That is the degree of association or interdependence among the major pieces of a program. And if you look closely here, you'll see that this quote dates all the way back to 1974. <laughs> and there's nothing surpris surprising here that this new, hip, modern architecture style that we are discussing at each and every conference nowadays is described in a 40 years old book. The ideas behind microservices are nothing new. Those are age-old design principles. They were tested out in different paradigms and even in other industries. For example, that's what Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the internet, says in his Principles of Design article. <coughs> He says, when you design a system and the features can be broken into loosely bound groups of relatively closely bound features, then this division is a good design. This is just good engineering. Maximizing connections inside of a service, increasing cohesion, and minimizing connections outside, reducing coupling. It is just good engineering. Therefore, microservices are nothing but services combined with some good engineering practices. In the same post, Tim addresses the fact that components make up systems, and those systems themselves are components in other, larger systems. And we always have to keep this in mind when designing software. Also, in 1972, even older than the original book, Barbara Liskov published a paper called A Design Methodology for Reliable Software Systems, in which she, she discusses how to achieve good modularity. And she likens good modularity to minimizing the connections between modules. Therefore, I want to reiterate, a microservice is a service with a micro interface, micro front door. The correct size of the interface is not an absolute value, it's relative. It's defined by the system that the microservice is a part of. And this brings us to good news, bad news. Bad news, there is no easy, easy way to evaluate a system's design. In a perfect world, we'd be able to feed a diagram of a system into some program and receive an objective grade. We are not there yet. In 74, Glanford Myers proposed such a way of grading a design for procedural code. About a, dec a decade later, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, Miller Page Jones proposed a concept called Kinescence, a way of evaluating object-oriented design for, for uh, grading its level of cohesion and coupling. I believe one day we will have such a thing for microservices, but we are not there yet. Good news, we've accumulated lots of design heuristics that can greatly help us to streamline the process of decomposing systems into microservices. I want to show you 10 heuristics that I found most useful at our company. First, always decompose to bounded contexts. If you notice terms that mean different things to different people, define strict boundaries, strict bounded context, and decompose the system accordingly. Do not implement conflicting models in the same service. Otherwise, believe me, there will be balls of mud in your future. 
Again, in our experience, we've been there. That's why we embarked on this adventure of decomposing our system. At one point, we built such a huge monolith with a lot of conflicting models that we just felt that something is wrong, we have to change it. Second, do not decompose bounded context further unless you've got a good reason to do so. And that's Martin Fowler's first law of distributed object design. Don't. <laughs> because, you see, microservices are great. We can hear left and right about the benefits of this approach. But as each distributed system, they do come with a set of challenges and hurdles. Microservices have their pros and cons, just like wider boundaries do. So it's crucial to verify whether you are actually dealing with a monolith that limits your, your ability to deliver business goals. Because a monolith is not a type of project or a code base then longer than some number of lines of code. No, a monolith is an architecture that undermines business goals, such as delivering functional or non-functional requirements. If you have wide boundaries, but you can still deliver both functional and non-functional requirements, Keep it simple. The wider, the wider boundaries have their own advantages. For example, they are more flexible. They are easier to refactor. You can always change your mind and move things around, try out different models. When you have, when you all already divided your system into multiple services, such refactoring becomes much more challenging. So, decide for yourself whether you really need it or not. As an example, back in our days when our company was just started, we were one team working on a Greenfield project. We divided the system into those two pretty big bounded contexts, and we stayed there because for the time being, it was OK. That was just what we needed to continue delivering work in software as fast as possible. Now, let's say you've evaluated the options, and you came to the conclusion that you do need to decompose further. You do need those benefits of microservices. And the next level is the level of business subdomains. And domain-driven design is of great help here. As you know, DDD distinguishes three types of subdomains, core, supporting, and generic. And we found this categorization to be extremely useful in decomposing systems into microservices. Generic subdomains are all the stuff that all companies are doing in the same way. For example, in our company, we have identity and access subdomain, a telephone system, and billing. All these domain subdomains are complex and honestly boring. According to domain driven design, those are already solved problems, and there is no point in investing time, money in in, in inventing your own solution. It will be cheaper and safer to pick an existing implementation and just use it. And it makes a lot of sense to treat those third-party solutions as separate services, if possible, of course. And of course, keep them in their own boundaries of their business domains. In addition, it may be beneficial to abstract its model and implementation details by implementing a thin anti-corruption layer that will be used as a proxy between the adopted product and your system. Not only this ACL exposes a more convenient model to work with, but it also limits the public interface of the actual systems, sorry, it also limits the public interface of the product that you are integrating with, and it fits this interface to your system's needs which makes them a well-behaved microservices. The opposite of generic are core subdomains. Here, the company is inventing something new, or maybe optimizing some existing practices to gain competitive advantage. Or, in other simpler words, this is how the company is making money. For us, our campaign management, our CRM system, our way of calculating sales agents' commissions are all examples of our core subdomains. Inherently, core subdomains have complex business logic. But contrary to generic subdomains, here we cannot and do not want to use an existing implementation. Here we want to 
invent our own solution. By in inventing our own solution, we are doing something in a way that is not accessible to other companies, to our competitors. But inventing something new is not easy, especially complex business models. Lots of diff different implementations have to be tried out in order to find you know, the one that maximizes the company's profits. And I'm not only talking about the technical perspective, but the business perspective as well. Usually, it's the first version is going to be delivered, and then in the second one, the business guys will, will want to optimize the results. They will want to try to change things, things to earn more money. And in other words, this logic is complex, it's going to change, and it's going to change often, especially in the early stages of the project. Therefore, do not rush to decompose them any further than the boundaries of the business subdomain. If you do need to decompose further, wait till you gain more domain knowledge and the system's design requirements stabilize some over time. Because you really don't want those changes to affect your decomposition which, which already happened. Making changes across wrong boundaries is, first of all, it's painful and the complexity of the change will be orders of magnitude higher. Exactly, by the way, the situation we found ourselves in when we decomposed a system into those tiny microservices. That was our core business domain. And finally, supporting subdomains. As generic subdomains, they do not provide any competitive advantage to the company, but they are needed to support the company's core business. For example, to publish advertising campaigns we have to manage our creatives, our contracts with publishers. For, to have a CRM system, we have to manage our sales desks around the globe. There is nothing complex in these domains. We didn't have to invent anything novel and smart here. Those are simple CRUD interfaces for managing records. And also, contrary to the core domains, this business logic changes pretty rarely. Therefore, we found it safe to decompose the supporting subdomains further if it's needed, even at the earlier stages of the project. That's where the approach of having those tiny services, each representing a distinct business entity or process, did work well for us in case of supporting subdomains. And as an example, I can recall that when we worked on the creative catalog, one of the business entities didn't really quite fit the infrastructure we were using, and we wanted to, to use a different set of tools, a different database, and a different language to implement it. So at that stage, it was safe to extract this logic and implement it as a, as a separate microservice. Those were the three heuristics related to the different subdomains. Now, let's look at the decomposition from a different angle. Let's say we have two methods that operate on the same data. We can decide whether they belong to one service or can, or can be decomposed into two services by evaluating their consistency requirements. If they require concurrency control, which means only one of these methods can be executed in parallel, then both belong to one service and cannot be decomposed. If one service should always read the last write of the second one, then they can be decomposed into two services, but integrated through a synchronous call. Lastly, if they can settle for eventual consistency, then they can be decomposed and integrated asynchronously through events. Of course, those are not hard rules, those are just heuristics for what is possible. There is no reason in implementing asynchronous communication if a simple synchronous call can still do the job. From our experience, I can recall having two services, and at one point, we understood that although the models were a bit different, they operated on the same data. And we needed this concurrency control between them. So we tried inventing some magic to synchronize those changes, those distributed locks, stuff like that, up until the point that we said, okay, screw it. We are merging them together, and that was the right solution. And speaking of asynchronous communication, exchanging events became the default way of integrating microservices. Those events 
just like methods are parts of services public interfaces. So let's see some heuristics for optimizing events. Often services can emit quite a few types of events, especially true in event sort systems. But do you really need to expose dozens and even hundreds of different event types? In many cases, the events can, can be categorized into private events, which are the implementation details of the service, and public events, which are intended to be the service's public interface. Thus, exposing only those public events minimizes the service's front door. It also frees you to change the implementation details without affecting the integrating systems, the in clients that integrate with your service. Another way to minimize event-based public interface is to compress them. Let's say you have a service emitting three types of events. Email changed, phone number changed, and address changed. Do you really, really need to expose such fine-grained events? Think about combining them into one, contact details change event. And of course, if you need to, you can keep those smaller events as private implementation, de implementation details, but expose the wider event as a part of the service's public interface. And another way to minimize the external footprint of the events is to notice that not all events are made equal. Everyone uses the term event nowadays, but if you listen closely, you will notice that there are two types of events. When we are speaking about events in the DDD community, we imply domain events, notification that something interesting has happened in the business domain. For example, a new lead was received, lead was converted, or campaign started. But if you listen to people outside of our community, for example, Randy Schaub, you will see that by events, he means something else. For him, and I quote, an event is a notification that some state has changed. They're only describing the actual change in a state without any relation to the business context. It might sound limiting, but it makes lots of sense for integration purposes. You can have domain events inside of a service, but expose outside only state change events, thus keeping the domain knowledge inside of the service and minimizing its external footprint, its external interface. And if you're exposing events at the service's public interface, make sure that they are explicit. For example, here's a service meeting agent assigned to lead events. It's an example from one of our systems. The meaning of this event is implicit. What does it mean if we receive three such events, one after another? Does it mean that three agents are assigned, or should the last one override the previous ones? This creates an implicit coupling between the service and its clients. The clients do have to make assumptions about the business domain its design and its logic. This design can, of course, be improved, for example, by introducing an intermediate event stating that the previous agent was unassigned, or have one event type but call it assi assigned agent changed. <coughs> Both are much more clear, and the clients won't need to make any assumptions and guesses about its meanings, because it's just another way of coupling to services. And the last two heuristics are for the after-the-fact scenario. Let's say you have two services and you, send, you sense that something is wrong. Each time one of them changes, the second service has to change as well. Typically, that indicates that the services are tightly coupled. Therefore, evaluate these, those reasons for change and if you find commonalities, check whether you can loosen the coupling between those services. If not, consider merging them into a single service, because what changes together goes together. And as Kenny said in his session earlier today, don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it. Been there and done that. 
And for the final heuristic, let's get back to the public door metaphor. If a service's public interface is wide and contains many business-wise unrelated methods, then it can be split apart into smaller services. Also, compare the methods that are used for implementing the business requirements and the methods implemented for integration purposes. If more methods were added for the sake of integration, it might be a sign of a distributed monolith or a beginning of it. Consider reevaluating the service's boundaries. In such case, the system's design might be simplified greatly by merging some of those coupled services together. So those are the 10 design heuristics that I wanted to share. Now, let's have a quick recap of what we've seen. First, a service is a unit of functionality exposed to the world through its public interface, its front door. A microservice is a service with a micro interface. The size of the micro interface is not absolute. It depends on the use cases of the overarching system. Our goal here is to reduce the global complexity of the system, the interconnectedness of its components. We've seen that, we've seen that the minimal decomposition level is bounded context. I saw some people frustrated with phones. <laughs> yes, Julian, speaking about you. <laughs> okay. We've seen that minimal decomposition level is bounded context. Do not implement conflicting models in the same code base. Always decompose to bounded context. Fowler's first law, you should think twice before decomposing any further. Distributed systems have their challenges and hurdles. If you've decide to, decided to decompose further, evaluate type of the business subdomain that you're working with. Generic subdomains, the solved problems should be bought or adopted, and their implementation can reside in a separate service. Optionally, this service can be proxied by a thin anti-corruption layer. <coughs> Core domains are the competitive advantage of the company. They are complex, risky, and they change often. So don't rush decomposing them into tiny services. Instead, stay in the boundaries of the subdomain and decompose further only after you've gained enough knowledge of the business domain and the changes in the business requirements somewhat stabilized. Supporting subdomains, on the other hand, are simple and change much less frequently. Thus, they can be decomposed further even at the early stages. Evaluating consistency requirements can help us decide if two methods belong to one service or they can, can be split across multiple services. And of course, how they, how they can communicate with each other. Exposing tons of different event types couples the service to its clients. So consider having private events as implementation details, but exposing a more restrained set of public events. A way of minimizing the number of outfacing events is to compress data from multiple private events into a wider public event. Also remember that events come into flavors, domain events, and state change events. Use both types when they are needed. They can be really useful in, in their contexts. Make sure that events are self-describing and explicit. Do not make the client second-guess their meanings. If you have multiple services that change in the same rate, look for ways to reduce coupling between those services. If it can be reduced, consider merging them into one service. And finally, evaluate the service's front doors, their public interfaces. If they are too wide, consider decomposing the service into smaller ones. Or if there are much more integration-related methods, then consider reassessing the boundaries to simplify the system's design. And I will finish with this diagram because I really like it. If you can remember that if you keep decomposing past this threshold, you are getting back to where you started. 
And this is the source code of this presentation. Everything I've shown you was composed from these books, papers, presentations, and of course my experience at our company. And that's about it. Do you have any questions? So example where state changed events where the better solution is when we notice that the same I can call it business logic kept repeating itself in all all the clients because the domain event didn't really reflect the state but all the all the clients needed was the state so they had this business logic which we kept replicating across all of them, and of course, if the model of the events in the original service was changed, this change affected all the clients, and that's like the best definition of coupling. And about domain events, the question was about integration of services. Yeah, so when, when you sense that the clients need a state, use state change events, because you are generating this state which is optimized for integration at one place. All the rest are just using. But domain events can still be useful. They can be used in parallel. You can expose both state change events and domain events. Uh, example, as an example, we do have services that do need domain events. For example, a client, a, we have this purchase page and we have to notify the client that the purchase was completed. So this is a domain event. Now, transforming it into some state with a checkbox that the notification was delivered didn't <laughs> Didn't feel good, so we just delivered the domain event in this case. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. More questions? One, two, three, yes. <laughs> Would you say that uh, these types of events, of state changed events, is only for integration purpose? So when one service uh, populates this event, it says the other server, oh, don't uh, do any business logic, just update some kind of data. But when there is a domain event, it can affect, okay, the process stops here and another process is going on now. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're using those state changed events when the clients, all they need is some kind of state. They need some model, which is not event sourced model, but, you know, an old school model with a state. It can just display on, on their user interface, for example. More questions? <coughs> One, two, three, sold. No questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>